My guest today is my good friend, Christina Aldan. How are you, Christina? Hey, I'm doing really well, David. It's good to see you. Very good to see you. Uh, we were talking uh, earlier about, uh, I wanted you back on my show because you're, you're such a, an intelligent person. You always have something interesting to say. And you, you suggested you suggested a few things, but one of them you suggested was career change. And that, yeah. That really resonated with me because I don't know if you know this about me, but I was not always a computer guy. Oh, I didn't know that. I, my undergraduate degree is in something called biochemistry, and oh. I worked briefly in a lab, and then uh, I didn't really care for it. So uh -huh. I, I went back to school, and I had a, got a master's degree in finance, oh, and I actually okay. worked as a financial analyst for a while. I worked in that field for a few years uh -huh. until I became an unemployed financial analyst uh -huh. and I changed careers again and I became a computer guy. I went back to school and started oh, computer that is engineering so cool. and got a job, uh, you know, writing software and managing networks. And that's, uh, and that was, and that one took. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That one stuck. That one was just <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I've been through this and, yeah. and I, but so I know why I changed careers sometimes out of choice, sometimes out of necessity. But sure. Let's start off. What, why do people, what motivates people to change careers? Yeah, you know, I've been doing this um, this LinkedIn Live Wednesday mornings with one of my colleagues, Leslie Martinich, and she's um, she's worked in tech for a long, long time um, as an engineering leader, uh, especially in IEEE. She's been uh, very um, impactful in her leadership there. And so she, she's an electrical engineer then. Uh, well, she she's mostly in engineering in general, like software okay. development. So okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, risk management, especially. And so we were talking last week about this, and this is why it came up because it was on top of my mind, as well as uh, so for some personal reasons too. So you know, when we were starting to think about the types of career transitions there are, there's people they want to change industries, which you did, right? I studied chemical engineering. I had a full ride, uh, not a full ride. I had a scholarship uh, to an engineering school, Michigan Tech University um, for engineering. Wow. And Baskets. I studied chemical engineering. Yeah, yeah. I, I loved chemistry, and uh, but I didn't love being in the labs. Hmm. I didn't love being in those. That seems like a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chemist, right. Most chemistry takes place in the labs. Takes place in the lab. So I, I didn't mind the classes and the math and the, the, the balancing the equations and the looking and learning about everything. But I didn't like mixing, you know, very carefully in the centrifuge right. and, and just making sure it was millimeters off. It was too much for me. <laughs> Titration yeah, frustrated yeah. you. <laughs> and the smell of acetone all the time, right? It was like, <laughs> I'm having flashbacks myself from exactly. my biochemistry days. <laughs> so then I changed. I, I got my degree in ecology and environmental sciences. It was ah. still science based. Mm -hmm. um, and, and more I, outdoorsy. It was very outdoorsy. So I studied in the Australian rainforest. Wow. I, I taught um, as a as a TA. I, I helped with uh, all the physiology and plant anatomy classes, stuff like that. Loved it. Um, and and then I went into t marketing, uh, web development, web design, and then um, marketing, and you know, then speaking and and coaching, and leadership coaching. So uh, it was it was pretty. All of the things that led me along that path made sense to me at the time. You know, as I was okay. transitioning into industries, um, and it was very organic. Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's very abrupt. And people yeah. are like, oh my gosh, now what I'm going to do with myself, right? Like you said, you were an unemployed financial analyst and you, you needed to do something different. Absolutely. Um, I should yeah. point out that I was, uh, it was a month after my first son was born. So oh. for a year, I was just a stay-at-home dad, Yeah, which is a career in itself. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. My Jay was doing um, single dad when, when mm -hmm. he was at home with the two babies when I met him. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm. All right, so, so, uh, so yeah, let's, so let's go through some of the things. Why, 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 why do they change? They change. Uh, we we they, talked about it. you lose your old job. Yeah, that's that's yeah, one thing. You're yeah. laid off. If you get laid off. You can also get promoted. This is another thing that people don't think about for career transitions. Where you're rocking it. You're a really great developer. You're an amazing programmer, and you get promoted to be a people manager. 
Uh, and maybe you don't have the training or the skills, sure. right? So, so that can be daunting as well. So the transitions, they can really affect our mental health. And that's, that's what I talk about, right? Emotional intelligence, emotional resilience, and, and these transitions. I sit on the board of directors for a mental health nonprofit, in fact, for two of them. Hmm. And they teach us uh, in our training that the transitional periods of our life are the times that can be most stressful, like when students go from high school to college or things mm -hmm. like that. So any kind of transitions can affect our mental, our mental health. So okay. it's important to, while you go through those transitions, find somebody to help, right? You need a counselor or a therapist or a mentor, a mentor is one. I, I invite people to get a career mentor and also a technical mentor, especially in tech. So okay. I have mentees, for example, like I will, in honor of my late husband, I mentor Asian Pacific Islander students for, for mm -hmm. free. I, I donate my time of that to them. And a lot of times I tell them, sure, it's good to have a career mentor to teach you how to network and, and reach jobs and to, to, benefit from their network, from my network, right? But also get a technical mentor who can help you with the technical things in case you get stuck at work, in okay. case you are too afraid to ask, or if you're really close, but you don't have anybody in your own company that you can ask for help. So getting just even a career mentor and a technical mentor is a good step in helping you with those transitions for your career. The other thing that they can do is they can level up your resume, right? So they can take a look at what kind of requirements that the job application has and whether or not you're meeting them. And a lot of times a mentor will encourage you maybe to apply to roles that you're not perfectly qualified for, okay. but you know, they'll, they'll help you. So you'll feel a little bit more confident applying to those types of jobs, even if you think you're not perfectly qualified. And this happens a lot with my mentees where um, if every single requirement isn't perfect for the job application, they won't apply. Where as seasoned people who know um, and have applied to jobs before, sure. they actually will go through and just apply to jobs that maybe they're not 100% qualified for. Maybe you're only 90% qualified, but you can learn it. Or maybe you have a mentor who can help you quickly level up that skill and, and you know, learn the new, the new skill. So, I've heard there's a, I heard there's a, a gender bias in that, that, that women are less likely to apply for uh, yeah, the research, they don't have a hundred percent. Men are more likely to apply. Oh, I've got most of these qualifications. I'll That's throw right. my hat in the ring. That's uh, right. Is I, I don't have any, I haven't done any studies myself, but I have, I've read it on the internet, so it must be true. <laughs> no, that, that is, a, a, has been a repeated actually study. So, you know, it has been peer reviewed that women tend to not apply. Um, and even in certain cultures too, like I said, with Asian Pacific Islander students, uh, a lot of the Asian students grew up with tiger moms. <laughs> And so what, everything's got to be perfect. What's the tiger, tiger mom? mom, the tiger mom is, um, you know, the, the Asian matriarch stereotype okay. who, uh, everything has to be perfect and uh, everything has, you know, make sure you're representing the family well. And why didn't uh, you do this? And of very course, demanding it has to be this way. very demanding and family. expectant. Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, you know, a lot of that it, based on culture sometimes. Um, people will not apply because they don't mm -hmm. feel like they're, they're qualified. And it's really important to have that confidence during transition. So mm -hmm. one thing that you can do to build up your confidence is to sit with your core values and think about what those are mm -hmm. and how those relate to your work. Now, sometimes, you know, you lose your job and you just got to go get a new one and you don't really have the luxury of searching for a company or a job that aligns with your core values, right? right? But if we know what our core values are, we can 
look for alignment with those core values in our work. We can think, you know, I love helping children. That's a big core value for me. So I'm going to go work at some place like maybe Khan Academy, where they, they, they develop tools and education tools for children and they partner mm-hmm. with schools and they give a lot of that, that content away, right? Um, core values like uh, delivering excellence excellent products. Maybe that's a core value for you. Maybe um, respect is a big core value for you. When you know what your core values are, you know what you're bringing to the table when you're interviewing, right? When you know your core values are, you it helps you make decisions about whether or not this is a good company for you. I always tell the story of when I first came to Las Vegas <laughs> 17 years ago. And I had my little freelancing web design stuff that I was doing, you know, um, I went and I interviewed for an entry level front end person and sat down, had a good interview. Um, and they were like, okay, yeah. So, you know, we think you have the skills. We have multiple websites that we need to be managed. And I was like, okay, cool. And it ended up like they were all pornography websites and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, but, and it wasn't really a good match for me. Sure. Some, um, people, some people that's not a problem. Some people that's a big problem. Right. It wasn't a good match for me. I didn't want to get into it. I didn't want to manage multiple sites. I didn't want to um, just get into any of that. And so it just wasn't a good values match for me. At the time I said, no, no, thanks. Um, but you can imagine living in Las Vegas, there are a lot of different types of, of opportunities that come yeah. up, right? Uh, for some yeah. people, you know, we have uh, legalization of marijuana. For some people, that's not a good values match for them and their core values. They're not going to work at a dispensary. They're not going to work in the marijuana industry. Mm. And, and knowing what your core values are and knowing what you're all about helps you understand what you're willing to compromise and what's, what's non-negotiable for you. Right. That's interesting. I, I went through this actually uh, years ago. I wanted, I had an opportunity to build an e-commerce website and I took mm-hmm. it. Uh, but I realized after a while that I was unhappy because the e-commerce website was selling cigarettes. Oh yeah. And I didn't like yeah. the idea of promoting cigarettes. And they were the right. only thing that uh, there was a checkbox that said, I promised that I'm 18 years old. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. A child could actually check that. So I stepped sure. away for that reason. Sure. Yeah, that's a perfect example. I didn't. Of, of... I didn't think of it in terms like you did, but I, I realized in retrospect that it was it, it uh, conflicted with my core values. Yeah, and you and you can set that boundary, and you can enforce a boundary, and when you do that, you start to feel more confident about yourself yeah. and what you're bringing to the table. You know, so that's a really good way to to bring up your boost up your confidence. The other thing is, like I said, having a mentor who can review your resume. This is Mm -hmm. really, really powerful to have somebody who maybe sees resumes regularly or reviews them often. They can give you some good tips in how to improve it, especially for that specific role. So having a mentor who can help you review your resume as well. The next thing is like if you are searching for work, you have to balance your time. Okay. So we talked about how like you know, being a single dad, stay at home parent, stay at home dad, that's a full-time job right there. Yeah. And I was looking for work at the time and looking for work. That's two full-time jobs, you know? So you've got to figure out how to balance your time because otherwise your mindset will suffer. And even if your mindset is suffering, there's still small little ways that you can almost like take take little sips of, of fresh air almost, you know, it's like, it's like when you're treading water and you're out there and you can just barely, and you might dip down a little and then you just come up and you're like, Oh, sip of fresh air. Thanks. You know, (laughs) even these small little sips of fresh air you, you can do, you can go for a walk. You can grab a, a a coffee with somebody. You can Mm -hmm. um, make sure that you're sleeping at least, you know, seven hours a night. You can make sure that you're, you're eating nourishing foods so that when your nervous system does have to show up for you for the interview or the crying baby or whatever, your nervous system is actually optimally functioning and it's calm and you're supported. So you're not just dialed up to 11 and your nervous system is going, (laughs) right? Yeah. Good point. It's not only stressful, but it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of um, rejection involved That's in right. most 
job searches. Uh, yeah, you, there's so much rejection. Typically, we'll get that one reason, yes, usually. but on the way to that one yes, we get a lot of no's. It's hard to it's hard to say positive sometimes. Yeah, yeah, and they often don't tell you why. Yeah. So, making sure that you connect with those people, make sure you connect with a mentor here and there, or a friend, or your kids, or you know, just for me, nature is a big thing. When I connect with nature, it really mm -hmm. it really helps. But if you're searching for a job and you're trying to interview 24 seven and research and you're not sleeping well. And the first thing you do in the morning is get up and have four cups of coffee and get back to it. Cause I got to find a job. I got to find, in fact, what happens is you're coming from a place of desperation and exhaustion, and you're really not going to put your best interview foot forward. Right. right. Yeah. You just, you get burnt out. Really. You get burnt out. Agreed. I, I like the idea that you talk about mentors uh, that that are maybe outside of your own company. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people, a lot of pro companies have mentor programs, and yeah. sometimes they're very good, and sometimes they're not as good. Yeah. Uh, but don't. I think you're saying don't restrict yourself just to those. Find people that uh, that, yeah. that can help you regardless of where they were. Well, you know, uh, Lucky and Leslie dot com. Uh, Leslie and I. That's we, your podcast. We do this. Yeah, that's your, your a, the podcast stream. we do, and we do this this workshop and we've done it at different conferences and we can do it for corporations and places it and it actually has role playing so you can role play those conversations that are tough that are difficult um and you can practice them because what we know is that once you create the neural pathway and you have stimulated it then it's there so now all you gotta do is activate it more to essentially imprint it into your nervous system, right? So once you find, once you learn how to have a difficult conversation, that's just how you have difficult conversations from then on, right? A lot mm -hmm. of times people think, oh, I don't want to have this hard conversation, or I don't sure. want to have this tough interview, and I don't want to go back in because it's tough. In fact, I would just like to remind everybody that you've survived 100% of your worst days so far, you know? <laughs> and so what happens is when you have that first conversation that's hard, in fact, the next time you get into a situation where there might be a little conflict or you're negotiating salary, it's already imprinted there. So you're going to have the outcome is going to be a lot better for you because you've had that experience and you've done it. You've learned yeah. how to negotiate. So trust that and then lean into that a little more. I think a lot of times what people do is they go in and they go, oh, that last one was hard and it didn't work out and I got rejected. Now I'm going into this next one and it's going to be hard and I might get rejected. In fact, go into that next one and say, hey, I'm going into this next one and I, I'm even better prepared now because yeah. I practiced the negotiation, I practiced the hard conversation. And you can gain more confidence from that. I like it. And then uh, even if you do everything perfectly, uh, you can still get rejected. That's just that's just the nature of the beast. Is uh, yeah. It's that doesn't because you got rejected doesn't mean that you did anything wrong. It may that's have been right. perfect. That's right. All right so yeah. you've been through a few uh, career changes early yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, you've been uh, doing this career coaching and this mental health uh, uh, mentoring for a yeah. long time now. Yeah. Uh, are you sticking with it? Or are you gonna, are you considering any? Career yeah. changes in the so future. this is, you know, I've been doing emotional intelligence and emotional resilience stuff for a long time now, um, alongside my brand strategy consulting. Uh, and I used to consult mostly with mid-sized tech companies and smaller startups. And during lockdown, a lot of those companies went away. <laughs> they closed up shop and they got uh, jobs or, sure. you know, um, even the, the funding for the startups went way down dropped right. significantly. So people weren't, weren't getting funding as much. Um, I would start doing more coaching and doing more mentorship and doing more speaking then as a result of that. And I also have found this modality I've, I've been getting for emotional resilience and emotional healing. I've been getting myofascial release treatments. Have you ever heard of myofascial Wait, release? I don't, know what that, I don't know what that means. Myofascial I know what relief and treatments are. What was yeah. that first word? Myo means muscle. Okay. Fascial means our fascia. I don't know what that means either. The fascia in our body is connective tissue. It's what holds okay. everything else in place together. Yeah. So if you, if you eat chicken, 
and you peel apart the chicken and you know that slivery kind of that's the membrane connective tissue between the muscles that's the fascia uh, okay. yeah and it turns out the fascia can get dehydrated and it can get hard and kind of solid and you'll get some knots and you'll get your muscles and tendons kind of bunch up the fascia also can be very healthy and slippery and slidey and glidey and the muscles and the tissues and the tendons and the bones all go into place. Well, I've been getting myofascial release treatments. It's, it's like massage, but what happens is you also release this emotions from when the moment of the restriction happened. So sometimes these fascial restrictions happen from repetitive stress. We're, we're sitting at the computer all day, so over and over and over. Sometimes they happen, boom, at impact for a car accident, mm. right? And you'll hear this sometimes where people go, oh, yeah, my knee's never been the same since, since I, I fell in college and playing it. basketball. Oh, my, my neck's never been the same since that accident. In fact, what myofascial release does is it, helps the person bring awareness to that point of when the restriction happens it sits with them in that restriction unlike massage so you you hold the restriction for three five seven minutes and what happens is your nervous system and your body will go back into that memory almost the muscle memory and come out of the restriction and unwind your body. And it can be very, very emotional. Hmm. Now, remember, I'm the emotional intelligence woman. So yeah, so there's a, I've there's a physical people. aspect and an emotional yes, mental aspect. As yes, well. and so it's been very transformational. Hmm. And I went, uh, I've been getting treatments for a couple of years and then I uh, went and learned six basic techniques that you can do for your friends and family. I went to a seminar on a weekend and then I went to the actual place for a retreat for one month. And it was five and a half hours a day of myofascial release treatments of trauma release. So it was like 16 hours a week of trauma release, something like that. I don't remember how it worked. Um, it's like 16 to 20 hours a week. Oh, and wow. it was very powerful. You can get emotional about it. You can laugh, you can cry. And as it releases, it's permanent. Hmm. It's unlike anything I've ever w witnessed or experienced before. Very and I've cool. experienced lots of different healing. I've seen healers since I was 19 years old because I have chronic pain and also a, a mental illness. So I've seen a lot of different healers. And John Barnes's style of, of myofascial release healing has been completely completely transformational for my family, for myself. My mom had one treatment and she got up off the table and she was crying because she was like, I didn't know my knees could feel this good. Oh I, I had no idea. Wow. It was great. Yeah. So is this your new career? It's my new thing. So I, I took the classes, right? I went to the seminar, then I took a retreat for a month. Then I went back for another retreat for 10 days. And I said, Hey, I want to take those advanced classes. And they said, no, you can't, you have to be an MD, you have to be an acupuncturist, a, a midwife, massage therapist, physical therapist, chiro. So you said, you I'll just become one of those things to, to touch, right? Yeah. So that's what I'm doing. I'm taking massage classes now so I can go take the advanced classes and study under John Barnes for this emotional release technique for the psychosomatic release of trauma. Oh, excellent. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty incredible. It's hard though, when we're talking about transitions, it's quite a different split, right? From my, okay. from the tech industry. Now, sure. granted, I'm, I'm just, I've been tech adjacent for a long time because I went in from front end to marketing, to brand strategy, and then to like emotional intelligence and how we're connecting our products and services with people. Um, and then into coaching. So I guess like for me, it still makes sense. You know, the, tr <laughs> the transition still makes sense, but sometimes it can be a cha challenge because sometimes I feel like, oh man, you know, I don't have any consulting clients. Like maybe I should go help somebody with some marketing stuff. Like it's so in me, right? I've been doing it oh. for so long. I've been doing it for, 
18, 19 years, you know, since I first was freelancing back in the day. And so that I'm having a hard time with, like my identity, my sense of identity, because now I go to school uh -huh. and I'm not earning money like I was because I'm in school for so four days a week from all the way in the morning, all the way at night. And I'm working mm -hmm. on people, which is different. Touching bodies is different than writing up marketing campaigns and advising people. And so my sense of identity, I have to keep coming back to my core values, contribution, okay. growth, community, Helping and people. that's what I'm all about. And that's what this work is all about as well. So uh, when I start to lose my sense of identity and who I am, because I've identified with my work for so long, yeah. um, you know, I, like I, I get into people's stuff. Like even if I'm at, I was at the coffee shop the other day, like a new little coffee shop's place. And I'm like looking around like, oh, you know, they could market this better if they had this and they had that. <laughs> I'm looking, I'm like, you know, you could run a thing on your social media and have a campaign, right? Like I'm just trying to, I need to stop that <laughs> and bring get, it back in. It's way. so natural to me. Way. I look at a website, I'll think how it could be improved or I'll listen to somebody to speak and I think, <laughs> I want to, I want to advise them on being a better speaker or something like that. It's <laughs> Cause I don't have any clients, right? I don't have any marketing uh, client or brand strategy. This is, this is a full transition now. you're going towards. This is one of my transitions. So, oh. you know, we'll see how, how, how it works out. Um, I'm, I'm, like I said, I still have some mentees that I advise and, and help them out with some things and um, in school all the time now and constantly studying about the body and the nerves and the veins and the arteries and how they work together. So it's just really important, again, to think about my core values. So when I start freaking out about my identity and my place in the world, I'm like, no, that's okay. This is what I'm choosing and this is why. It's, it's good. It's good. But sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, I, maybe I should go sell a website or something. Like I haven't, <laughs> I'm not doing any marketing things. Yeah. Well, okay. Christina, this has been uh, really helpful. <laughs> I think a lot of people, uh, as you know, the tech industry yeah. is... Um, people change jobs a lot more a frequently lot. than other industries. And yeah. I think a lot of people watching the show are going to get a lot out of what we've said today. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me today. Technology is always more fun with your friends.